Hey there, I'm Dr. Ruth Roberts, your pet's ally, and today I want to talk with you a little bit about vaccinations. Vaccines are a hot topic for many reasons, especially with the advent of the COVID vaccine, but I want to give you my take on it. I am old enough to have seen so many dogs die from parvovirus and equally see that parvovirus vaccine protect puppies and young dogs against that really horrible and deadly disease. So because there is so much information and misinformation on vaccines on the internet, I wanted to give you some information that is based on science. I'm going to show you a couple of links to some articles that are really and um, really there's a couple of great ones will include some links. So in this article, Dr. Schultz goes through vaccines and uh, changing protocols, explains a bit about the immune system. In uh, this one, he goes through discussing titers, which is a very interesting concept. And I'll explain a little bit more about this in a couple of minutes. So all in all, like I said, there is a ton of misinformation out there. And the reason I'm mentioning Dr. Ron Schultz is that he has been researching dog and cat vaccines for decades. And he's studied most of the major manufacturers' vaccines for both safety and efficacy. And Dr. Jean Dodds is another name that you may be familiar with because she is one of the first people to uncover the relationship between too many vaccines especially the rabies vaccine and hypothyroidism in dogs, and in fact, the autoimmune version of hypothyroidism. Now, to kind of kick this off, let's start by discussing core vaccines in dogs, and they are rabies, parvovirus, distemper virus, parainfluenza, adenovirus, according to the ABMA and AAHA, so the American Veterinary Medical Association and the American Animal Hospital Association. Non-core vaccines are leptospirosis and bordetella and they are in Lyme vaccine and they are given based on need and possible exposure. There are other vaccines like coronavirus and rattlesnake vaccine that are simply not recommended. So what do these bugs do to dogs and why do we still need to vaccinate against them? Parvovirus, you are likely familiar with. It causes severe gastrointestinal disease, and in its most severe form, it can affect cardiac function as well. In the late uh, 70s to 80s, when it first appeared, it was killing entire towns of dogs, and it had an extremely high mortality rate. Treatment is symptomatic, meaning you just support the dog with fluids and things of that nature. And some of the antiviral drugs can offer a little bit of help as well, but it's really tough for them to get through and it does take quite a bit further to recover as well. It is still common even today, even though it's very easy to protect against. Distemper virus affects the central nervous system, causing tremor, seizures, and other severe symptoms associated with brain dysfunction. And it has an extremely high rate of death, almost 85% of affected dogs. In the 50s, when it was first seen, it was also running through towns and killing just almost the entire town of dogs. Today, thankfully, it is rare because vaccination has been available since the late 50s, early 60s, but in some areas, they can it can be seen frequently and it will be very common in unprotected puppies. I, in my 30 years in practice, I've seen probably maybe five cases of the disease, but it's always horrible. And it's just, a, it's really brutal to watch these guys suffer. Adenovirus or canine herpes is very uncommon and it works differently than it does in humans. In the 30 years, I've seen one puppy with blue eye where literally the cornea turns blue, so the surface of the eye. And this is the least severe symptom, but in dogs, the herpes virus actually can create severe disease as far as its effect on the liver. But more often, it was actually a vaccine reaction that created the blue eye. Other practitioners do still see it commonly in their states. 
Uh, lastly, the parainfluenza virus helps to protect against respiratory infections, but is not very commonly seen anymore, but can cause uh, a bronchitis type disease and a severe pneumonia. Now, coronavirus we'll still see rarely, but that's not so frequently. So we're kind of moving into the um, vaccines that are non-core now. Um, and it's been called a vaccine in search of a disease. Initially, it was thought to offer cross protection against parvovirus back in the 80s, but that has since been disproven. And the parvovirus vaccines have really improved dramatically since then. Now, one of the big controversies is leptospirosis, and it is a bacterial infection that can cause severe illness affecting the GI tract, the liver, and especially the kidneys. The issue is that the serovars or types of bacteria in the vaccine may or may not protect protect against what's actually out there in the wild, in the environment. I've had several situations where consultation clients had dogs with acute kidney injury, and one of the things uh, that they're trying to rule out as a cause of that kidney injury is lepto. But because the dog had had one lepto vaccine and the lepto test came up positive, their vet said, oh, well, it's probably from the vaccine and stopped treating and the dog got worse. So was it really because of the vaccine that the test came up positive or because this dog actually had leptospirosis and wasn't offered protection from the vaccine? And that's a really sticking point. So in almost 30 years in South Carolina, I saw leptospirosis in one dog with kidney failure. And I tested really frequently because it is a concern. We have a lot of swamp land and things of that nature. So if you're not sure if it's an, a problem in your area, what I would suggest to do is to look for incidence maps on Google or what ha your favorite search engine that show the actual number of cases of lepto to determine if this is a problem or not in your area. The other vaccines, such as rattlesnake vaccine, I'm going to leave out of this discussion is they simply just don't seem to be effective. Now, when we start talking about when to vaccinate puppies, the issue is that the puppies don't have the ability to develop their own antibodies until they reach somewhere around the age of 12 weeks. Maternal antibodies, uh, that, and these are things that they receive from mom through nursing on them, drinking colostrum, will end up protecting those puppies until about the tw age of 12 weeks, and then they start to drop rather precipitously. So what that means is that vaccinating uh, puppies that have been nursing for mom at six weeks, nine weeks, is generally not effective because we know the majority of puppies can't respond to these vaccines because the maternal antibodies are there, so the immune system says, hey, we're good. So um, the other issue is that the distemper fraction of the vaccine is immunosuppressive, which can actually render them more susceptible to parvovirus. So the exception to this concept is that is for puppies that have been bottle raised or were unsure if they ever received any colostrum from mom or we know that they didn't. This means that they never received the maternal antibodies from mom and dog and so they have absolutely no protection. In that case, then you can make the uh, make the case for giving parvovirus alone, hopefully, starting at six weeks of age, and also be very, very careful when you take them outside because essentially they have no protection. So you want to wait to start socializing, dog parks, et cetera, et cetera, until you know they've got some protection at 12 to 14 weeks of age. The other situation is when you have super high exposure, like shelters, where the risk of uh, encountering the virus itself is very high. And so what Dr. Schultz and Dr. Dodds have said is it does make some sense to start looking at giving parvovirus vaccine as early as nine weeks because their risk of exposure is much higher. If we're not in that situation, then start vaccinating at 12 weeks of age with the distemper parvo vaccine, and then again at 15 to 16 weeks. For rabies, it's at about 14 weeks in between those two vaccines or at 18 weeks every, after everything is completed. 
The other thing to keep in mind is that if a puppy and a kitten receive one vaccine at 14 weeks or older, then they are actually able to develop sufficient antibodies with that one vaccine to be protected for at least that next 12 months. So because we know that our maternal antibodies have dropped by that time, we're good and uh, they're able to amount their own immune response to the vaccine and create their own antibodies. Now, if you are adopting a dog and its vaccine history is unclear, but it's a little bit older at that 14 weeks of age or older, and you go to the vet for a distemper parvo vaccine, then you're golden. The one exception here is that if you live in an area where there is a massive parvo outbreak or you go to dog parks or something like that, then you may consider a standalone parvo vaccine booster if that's available or a distemper parvo booster three weeks after the vaccine. Now, it is possible for veterinarians to buy distemper and parvo vaccines separately, but it's difficult and frankly, most veterinarians don't have those single vaccine uh, valence vaccines available anymore. The distemper parvo plus adenovirus plus parainfluenza vaccine is very common. Uh, so in many cases, veterinarians will actually have the leptovirus or excuse me, leptobacterial uh, for portion available as well. And so you do want to make sure that for your young puppies that they are not giving that lepto fraction. So, and especially for puppies as young at six weeks of age, they just don't work with that well. And the lepto fraction is the part that tends to create um, really severe side effects and reactions. Now, if your dog is going to be exposed to respiratory viruses, so i.e. goes to boarding uh, kennels, grooming shops, dog parks, things like that, then my suggestion would be to consider the intranasal Bordetella vaccine, which often contains both Bordetella and parainfluenza. And there is an oral one available and an injectable, but the intranasal variety seems to provide the most protection. And I should mention that with puppies, this is what I would actually start at nine weeks of age, uh, especially if your puppy's going to have a lot more exposure. And um, also, I don't think there is uh, very many side effects that we see with this vaccine because the immunity stays locally in the nose, which is where we get exposed to any type of respiratory virus. They did try that with the flu vaccine in people, but unfortunately, it didn't work out too great. Um, so basically, the idea with the intranasal vaccine is that you breathe the Bordetella uh, bacteria in, the immune system in the nose is able to isolate it and attack it right there and prevent it from going further into the respiratory tract. Now, the injectable vaccine, again, is just about worthless. Um, and again, the oral one is less efficacious than the intranasal, but it is far more uh, effective than the injectable one. Now, let's talk about leptospirosis vaccine. Uh, Dr. Schultz has said in the past that virtually no veterinarians are giving it in a manner which would be effective. And um, this is such a huge problem because there, the other issue, as I mentioned earlier, is that we're not sure if the serovars in the vaccine are actually effective for what's in the wild as well. So his current recommendation is to finish all of the other vaccines and um, the distemper parvo, the rabies, everything, and then four weeks later, start the lepto series. Uh, so he would suggest that you give lepto number one, and then three weeks later, you give lepto number two. Three months after that, you give lepto number three, and then vaccinate every six months. Now, he made these recommendations at a talk he was doing for our local uh, veterinary association. And in print, what you will see, um, and let me pop over to our tab so I can show you this uh, link from Dr. Dodds, is that it should be given first at 14, 15 weeks, but not before 12 weeks, and then repeated three to six weeks later. Uh, and then and subsequent doses are to be 
given it at least one year and then annually thereafter as the duration of immunity has been short-lived. And you'll note this is from 2012. And if you do some more research on this topic, you'll see him say that you could consider it at, uh, you know, every six to six months to a year. So it's one of those super confusing ones. Now, the other thing is if you're, you know, again, if you're giving the vaccines to a puppy, you want to make sure that that puppy is going to be able to respond to it. So starting to vaccinate at 12 weeks of age with December parvo, again, at 16 weeks, rabies at 14 weeks or 18 weeks. And then with all the vaccines, you want to space them apart a minimum of two weeks so that the immune system has time to respond to each vaccine appropriately. And with all of these vaccines, I recommend giving Thuja at one drop per 10 pounds of body weight twice a day for five days. The goal with Thuja is that it's a master detoxifier. You can use homeopathic versions like the 30C, uh, which is a reference to the strength of the dosage, but I use the mother tincture. Basically, it's a tincture of Thuja and it's been effective for all of the vaccines. And when I started doing that, I just stopped seeing vaccine reactions, both short-term and long-term. Um, so again, use that mother tincture at one drop per 10 pounds of body weight, two times a day for five days. Now, that takes us through puppyhood. And what should we now do about adult dogs or juveniles. So for up to that 16 to 18 month range and your vet sends you a postcard, a text, whatever it is these days saying your dog is due for boosters, here's a few things that could happen. Generally, titers or blood tests to determine antibody levels in the bloodstream are just not appropriate at this age because we may get a positive titer that year, but the following year it may be negative or insufficient, which means you need to vaccinate. So what I generally recommend is, again, to vaccinate at that 16 to 18 month range after, so a year basically after all the other vaccines had been completed. And at that point, then pretty much in everybody's uh, mind, the dog is up to date for three years. It is considered protected for a minimum of three years. And again, I should mention at that 16 to 18 month range, do uh, use Thuja for the distemper parvo vaccine, wait two weeks, do the rabies vaccine and repeat the Thuja. All right, so now at three years going forward, then that's where you would do blood titers or blood test. And we know that um, the duration of immunity is at least three years. For some pets, it will begin to fall at four years. So after that three-year point, you should start to do a blood test every year to make sure that the protective levels are still present. So the other thing I wanted to mention to you is there is an interesting paper in regard to parvovirus. A homeopathic veterinarian wanted to prove that exposing naive puppies, meaning they had not been vaccinated uh, against parvovirus, but did have some maternal antibodies, to dog parks in small doses actually could protect them against parvovirus, and that's exactly what she found. Now, what she was able to do is show that they developed a titer. And so for that reason, basically, every time you take your dog for a walk, most often it is re-inoculating itself against parvovirus, which is cool. So, uh, so her recommendation was to take your puppy to a very low density dog park and take it in for two minutes, pick it up and take it right back out. Next week, go back for three minutes, so on and so forth, until you increase that time of exposure to five or 10 minutes. And at the end of six weeks, what she was able to show is that the puppies had positive protective titers against parvovirus. It did not work for distemper virus. But again, this is a disease that we don't see very commonly, but if it's endemic in an area, it is just not fun. Now, lastly about the rabies virus. Uh, some years ago, Dr. Dodds and Schultz launched the seven-year rabies challenge. And the it was kind of frustrating because uh, at that five-year mark, 
Well, I'll explain kind of the long history of it. So essentially, they had a group of puppies and kittens who were given vaccines at 12 weeks and older. And I think they actually chose about 14 weeks and then boosted again roughly one year after that. They also had a group of puppies and kittens that were not vaccinated. And they started doing titers every year. What they saw is in year four that something like 15% of the pet's titers had dropped below what was considered to be protective, five micrograms per deciliter. At year five, something like 35% of that group were considered as non-protective titers, but Dr. Schultz believed that the innate immune system would know how to handle the virus. Now, two things happened. They reached that five-year mark, and to do an effective rabies challenge study, the USDA has to be involved because if you get rabies, 99% uh, of the time it is lethal. So uh, Dr. Schultz had his study animals taken to the USDA facility. They had a group of control pets that had not been vaccinated and then the vaccinated group. And the USDA considers a study valid when 80% or more of the unvaccinated controls develop rabies virus symptoms, so they actually get the infection. So at five years, all those pets that had been vaccinated, whether they had protective titers or not, none of them developed rabies in that My Virus Challenge, and more than 80% of the unvaccinated control animals did develop rabies. So at seven years, they had the same setup. Um, so vaccinated pets, unvaccinated pets, animals, and unfortunately this time only 79% of them developed rabies in the control group, meaning the unvaccinated pets. So the USDA declared the study to be non-valid. But um, probably these pets really are protected by the innate immune system, which is really, really cool. Now, because of this, uh, the Department of Health and the USDA and the others that write the rabies compendium came out in 2016 saying that a titer, a blood test, may indicate uh, protection. So where this comes into place is that if your dog or your cat bites somebody, you will get a visit from the Department of Health in your area and you, if that pet has ever had a rabies vaccine, they are considered up to date and they will be given an at day 10 at home 10 day quarantine. And then after the 10 days, the Department of Health comes back, they will ask you to revaccinate your pet. In some situations and in some areas, they are considering uh, rabies titers to be protective. And so they may not require that uh, vaccine to be repeated. So that's a lot of information in a super short time. Uh, one thing I did want to share with you is this slick little handout we've made for you uh, about which vaccines does my dog actually need. Um, these are the ones that are considered the most useful. And so here, here it is laid out, you know, six to eight weeks for bottle pet fed puppies, just parvo. Uh, you can consider these others and then using Thuja after each of them. And so we take this all the way through uh, 16 weeks and then four plus years. So that's what I've got for you. I'm hoping this is helpful um, and that this really helps to dispel some of the myths. I just... You know, it was just so heartbreaking to see parvovirus affect and kill puppies uh, that, uh, you know, it's one of those deals. Vaccines are there for a reason. Do we over vaccinate in, the, in our veterinary profession? Absolutely. Is there clear evidence for not giving a vaccine every year with the exception of Bordetella? Absolutely. However, many of my colleagues still haven't caught on there. So that's what I've got for you today. For more great information like this, uh, definitely hit the subscribe button. We'll keep the videos coming for you. And then check the links below here and sign up to get this download so you can uh, keep that handy and know kind of what to discuss with your veterinarian. I'm Dr. Ruth Roberts, your Pets Ally.